I want to just share with you really quickly the word that the Lord put on my heart for today uh, for our church family. Amen. And I'm, I'm reading from Luke chapter 15. You could turn there or click there or pretend to do that. Uh, Luke chapter 15. I'll be starting at verse 11. And even before I read that, I, I had this really weird experience this past week that um, for me it was kind of weird. I had a friend of mine come to visit me, this guy named Mike Mancini, great man of God, great preacher, and um, he came and we were visiting, and I, I've held a lot of meetings, I've, I've met a lot of pastors, and he kind of hit me with something that no other pastor has ever asked me. He came to meet me here, and, um, and he's like, hey, can we walk around your neighborhood? I'm just like, what, whatever, so that's fine. So we start walking around the neighborhood, and, and if you might not know this, I grew up in this neighborhood on Colorado Avenue. I lived there for 25 years. Like, so I know these streets like the back of my hands. I know most of the people in this community. And so I got a heart for this community. Right? I really love this part of town. I love what God's doing here. I love the people here. And so, and so I was actually just walking, and I was just, he didn't know this, but I was walking to all the sites where I did bad stuff. And, <laughs> and don't judge me. I wasn't always saved. And so this is a true story. So, so I, get, I end up walking like, by my father's house. 610 Colorado Avenue, and I'm looking at all the different areas, and I'm telling stories. We're exchanging stories about my childhood versus his childhood, and as I'm standing in front of my dad's house, I got emotional, and I got all choked up. I started crying, and it's hard for me to admit that because, you know, I still want to think that I'm a thug, praise God. And so, and so true story, I'm sitting there crying. He's just looking at me. He got this really big beard. He's like, it's cool, man. It's all right, man. I get it. And I was crying, probably he didn't even know this, because I'm thinking about all the good memories I had in that house. Have you ever, I don't know if you've experienced it before, you lived in a place for a long time, and you drive by it later on, you're like, oh my God, we had such good times there. Like, for me, that was my father's house. And I was remembering, like, the silly stuff that me and my brother did. Like, one day, um, we would take, and, and we would, my, my, we got on punishment in our bedroom, and, and my parents made the mistake of putting us together in the same room. And so, my brother had this medication that he had, and his little tubes, we had dozens of little tubes of this medication, and we took, somebody took a Q-tip, I don't even know who started it, took a Q-tip and, and flicked it at the house next door with the medication on the tip of the Q-tip, and this miracle happened, it stuck to the house. And so 500 cotton swabs later, I didn't tell the first service this, but we even switched rooms. We went to the other bedroom to get more of the house. And um, we, God told us to, amen, but... We had like really good memories. Like my dad used to deliver newspapers and so we used to have these wars with the kids next door that we didn't like them. And so they were, they were, like, they were like these other kids. We just didn't like these kids. They were mean, they were bad. And so we had this big dog named Lobo and we would take, don't, don't judge me for this. My dad delivered papers. We would take his, his bowel movement and put it in the bag and let the hot sun just heat it up and throw it at these kids in the neighborhood that we didn't like. And it would just explode. It was terrible. And like, so I'm sitting there like all the good memories I had in this house. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, I'm like, man, I had such good times in this house. And I'm sitting there crying because I remember that there was a time in my dad's, in my life that I wanted to leave my dad's house. Like I was so like bent on leaving dad's house. I didn't like dad's rules. And my dad wasn't a bad father. He was like the best dad ever. But my dad had rules that I didn't like. Stuff like don't get high in your bedroom. Um, <laughs> stuff, this is a true story. Like, you shouldn't get drunk in the attic. Like, you know, stuff like that. That I felt like I should be able to do whatever I want because I'm, I'm 15. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, I can't wait to leave my dad's house. Like, this guy's a tyrant. And not realizing he was doing stuff for my good. Like, you know, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes in the living room. Like, just stuff like that. It was just dumb stuff that I was doing. And I remember this time where I wanted to leave my dad's house. And as I was standing there with Mike, I, I began to think about Luke chapter 15, verse 11, where Jesus tells the story of a young man who really wanted out of his father's house. This young man who really wanted out of his father's house. He had it all figured out. And we see his story unfold in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And it says this, Jesus talking, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into, somebody say, a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20 begins to read and it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us celebrate, let's eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Come on, let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus If you don't speak, we have nothing to hear. So we ask you even now that you would speak through me, Jesus. We ask you that this word would fall on good soil, that you would speak to hearts and minds alike who are in need of your word, of encouraging word, God. We pray that it would take deep root in us and that you would have your way. Come on, the church says. So Jesus in this scripture is telling what is known to be a parable. And a parable in scripture is a short story or an illustrated story that Jesus gives and inside that story is nestled a spiritual truth, amen? So Jesus tells a story, and in that story is a chock full of these spiritual truths, and this is how Jesus would often get his point across to people who were listening to his teaching all around him. And so Jesus has told two other stories so far. This is one of three stories, and in the two prior stories, he tells first of a sheep who got lost and of a shepherd who left everything to find that sheep. And when he finds that missing sheep he throws a party because this lamb who was missing is now found amen then Jesus tells a story of a lost coin and in the story of the lost coin this woman loses her valuable coin and she calls her neighbors to help her find it and when she finds it she begins to celebrate because she found this coin but now Jesus is telling a third story and in this third story Jesus is drawing a principle that he values people above property And he values this son above what people, when they lose things. And so he's joined this idea that Father God cares about lost sons and daughters. And for that, I think all of us can just say amen. Amen. That God cares about us when we're lost. And so Jesus is telling the story of these two sons, one a younger son who went to his dad and basically says this, Dad, I don't want to wait till you die. I want everything that comes to me for my inheritance right now. Like, I don't want to wait till you're gone, Dad. I just want to take what's mine right here and right now. Now, even by today's standards, that's a little bit disrespectful. But in the times of the Bible where honor was of the utmost in their culture, this was something that was arguably punishable by death or just casting out of the family. But the father being tenderhearted towards his son, he obliges the son and he gives him his portion of the inheritance. This was worthy of the father disowning the son, but instead the father acts in a different type of way that might have shocked the listeners of Jesus in that time. He didn't want his father's house anymore. He didn't want his father's rules anymore. He wanted to shake free of his father's rules, of his father's uh, lordship over his life. And he looked at the gift of his father's inheritance to him as a debt that his dad owed him. Dad, just give me what is mine. And sometimes I believe that even in church, Christians, we, even as people, can act like that, where we demand things of God and we treat the gifts of God as if God is indebted to us as people. We pretend that God, God, you have to do this for me. God, you gotta give this to me. And we, we don't want God's rules in our lives. We don't want God's love in our life. We just want the benefit of having a father like God to be able to extract from him all that we can, but in the end, go off to a far country and live however we desire. And that's where this son finds himself. He was foolish. He had this like, he wanted his best life now type of deal. He wanted his riches now. And the father, undoubtedly heavy hearted, obliges the son's request. And I love how verse 13 says it, that not quickly thereafter, that not many days later, 
the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into this far country. Can I segue for a moment to tell somebody that the moment you begin to, to, to demand things from God, that you're not too far off from going to a far country from God. The moment you begin to, to walk away from God just one step at a time. I heard this silly joke one time. I said, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. How do you walk away from God just one step at a time? It's just one bad decision at a time. One after the other with shame and guilt come on. And this young man quickly, the Bible says, he quickly goes to this the, the far country, as distant as he can go, and he squanders all that his father gave him. Don't worry, that's never happened to you that you've demanded things of God and quickly squander them. I know I've been there. But he literally lives recklessly, loses everything, and then the Bible says a famine hits that land. In the Bible times, a famine was when there was no rain, there was no crops, meaning there was no food. And so he's now starving, and he goes to get a job now. Now he has to go work for somebody. He, he was a rich son. Now he has to go work for somebody. And he goes to work for this guy in a pig farm. And that might not mean much to us. We'd be like, you know, he got a job. Good for him. He's back on his feet. But in those days, for a Jewish person, pigs were unclean animals. They couldn't even touch pigs, let alone have bent knee, ribs, and pork shoulder. They couldn't have bacon and ham the way we're blessed to be able to partake of that. Now, a side note here, you might not realize this, that I call bacon a victory meat. Because before the cross, I couldn't have it. After the cross, victory, we could have bacon. Every time I eat bed, kneel, and bacon, I think of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's a side note. That's a whole other teaching for a different day. Praise God. So this young man is in this pig farm, and he cannot, like, he's at the lowest of the low in his life, man. He's reached this place where he is starving. He's desiring to have the food of, of pigs. He's desiring to eat what they're eating. But he's reached this low place. Now, in this story, the father of the son is a picture of Father God. It's a picture of the goodness of God, the fathering of God in our lives. And the son is like many of us at some point in our lives where we decide that we want life apart from God. Now, if we try to deny that fact, we lie to ourselves because of what Romans 3.23 tells us. It says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That we were all at one point enemies of God. We were all at one point distant from God. We were all, every single one of us. Look to the point next to you. The person next to you, just look at them. That, that all includes them, right? That we were all far from God. We were all enemies of God. So when we hear sermons like these, we don't discount them because number one, we came from that, or number two, we're in that, or number three, the devil might get us back into that, and so we have to keep our heart guarded at all times. So the Bible says that he is sitting there having this, this time, and he's, he's like literally in the lowest place of his life. Now, some of you might know this story in the Bible as the story of the prodigal son. A prodigal, by definition, is somebody who spends recklessly or is excessively or extravagantly wasteful in their financial decisions. And this young man is called prodigal because he spent all that he had, all of his riches, on a sinful lifestyle. Now, for each and every one of us, maybe we qualify for that in areas of our lives. And maybe you may say, well, I haven't, you know, wasted all that God has given me. But many of us have wasted many moments of a life that God has given us. Some of us waste our time as God has given us. Others waste our resources, our finances in living that doesn't even please God, in things that don't honor God. And this young man, he's at the lowest place he can possibly be. He found himself so low and so far. And I love what verse 17 says. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of your father's higher servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Do you know what that means, church? Here's point number one, that he had a revelation of his situation. Like, as people, we need to ask the Lord for a revelation of our situation. Like, God, like, what is the true condition of my soul? What's the condition of my heart? What's the condition of my life? Where am I living? Am I living in your will or out of your will, God? He had this revelation. Here is what he, was revealed to him, right? I love it. He had a meeting with himself. He came to himself and says, hey, bro, we got a problem. Like, we're starving here. And they both agree, like, yeah, we're starving here. 
And then he says this, in my father's house, even the servants have more than we have. In my father's house, the servants have more than I have right now. The young man has reached rock bottom. He's lived it up. He's done life his way. He's done everything that he's wanted, but it's found him in a place of poverty, in a place of starvation, in a place of brokenness. He went to this far country because it's so easy to go so far from God. And in this room might be people who haven't been to Father God's house in a while, and you've been far from God. And then also in this room are other people who are in Father God's house every week, but your heart is still far from God. Your actions are still far from Christ-like, and you don't even reflect the image of your Father. And so in this room, the conditions of our heart, there might be many, a prodigal among us. And he reaches this place of utter brokenness and rock bottom. But he had this revelation that in my father's house, there's provision. That in the house of my father, he begins to realize that in his father's house, even on the bad days, there was more than enough. He realized that I made this mess. I actually chose this because I made bad choices. And he also decides that I can get up. I can arise and go, as the Bible says. I can make this better by returning to my father's house. The Bible says he came to himself. He got to the end of himself. Have you ever got to the end of yourself? Come to the point where you were so low and so broken and in so much need that it was your very brokenness and neediness that actually spoke the message that in your father's house there's sustenance for you. That why did you ever leave Papa's house? That in God's will, in God's purposes for your life, there is joy. That in God's will, there is peace. That in God's will, it might not mean that everything is perfect, but everything is planned by God. That in God's will, everything you need is present. That in God's heart is everything towards you that is good. He says, man, in my father's house. Why did I ever leave? In my father's house. He got to the bottom, but he finds out what Moses says in Deuteronomy 33, 27 about God. That actually God is at the bottom. You see, Moses says in Deuteronomy 33, 27, he says, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms of God. That when I get to rock bottom, when I get to the lowest places of my life, that there I find God is with me. That there I find that God's everlasting arms are holding me. That there, even when I tried to ruin myself, that God was with me. And he kept me when I didn't want to be kept. He protected me when I was being foolish. He loved me when I was being unloving. He was doing things for me that nobody else could see. His everlasting arms. He had this revelation of his situation. And here's what he realized. that In my father's house, there's so much more. That in my father's house, there's provision. That in the house of my father, there is hope. You see, no matter where you are at in your walk with God, each and every one of us on a daily basis needs to say, Lord, show me the condition of my heart. For if there be anything wrong, that I might be able to remedy it by coming to your house. By seeking your face, God. By putting you first. Now, at this point in the story that Jesus is telling, the people who are listening to Jesus are like, this young man is getting what he deserves. He absolutely is getting what he deserves. He disrespected his dad. He deserves to be gone like in the mud. He deserves to be like all broken down and disgusted. But Jesus is about to actually have a story twist and a story plot that is exceedingly powerful. It's a twist in the story of Jesus. See, for many of the listeners of Christ, this was a fitting end. Jesus could have told the story, left it here, and they would have been like, this is perfect. But Jesus would have nothing of the sort. He begins to take it to a different place. And Scripture tells us that in Luke 15, 20, this young man begins to take this walk of shame home. He begins to rehearse this, like, this This apology, I'm going to tell my father these things. This apology, I got this whole thing planned out. I got it perfectly planned. I'm going to go home and tell my dad that I messed up and that he should treat me like a slave, not like a son, like a servant, not like his child because of all the mistakes that I made. And so the Bible says that he goes home. And he begins to take this walk of shame. But the Bible tells us that the father saw him from a long ways off. And he began to feel compassion for his son. And he runs to his son and he receives him with an embrace and a kiss 
on his cheek. The son expected rejection, but instead he's received by his father with great tender love and care. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been some days where I've made mistakes and I said, Lord, I don't know how you can forgive me for these mistakes. But when I come to him, he does not reject me. He receives me. And that leads me to point number two, that God sees us and God receives us. Isn't that wonderful to know that God, he's looking out for us, that God has this compassion about him, that he's receiving us and he's looking for me and he sees me. The Bible says he saw him from a long way off and he began to run, run rather, to this son of his. Tells me two things. Number one, this father was okay with being undignified. In those days, the senior men never ran. They absolutely never ran. It was undistinguished of them. It was, it was actually almost dishonorable to run. But he didn't care because he saw his son. He picks up his robes, gathers them in his arms, and takes off in the direction of the broken son that he sees. The son was undoubtedly in tattered clothing, looking hungry because he was starving. He sees the son, and he receives him. It's just like, what, what, is, what kind of grace is this? What kind of mercy is this that he pours out on him? That when the son comes, he doesn't receive rejection. He receives mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. And instead of being cast away because of how sinful he was, being cast away because of all the mistakes he's made, instead, the father embraces him. And he begins to love on him because God sees you right where you are. You see, Peter talks about this in 2 Peter 3, 9. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Did you hear that? That God is long-suffering? Simply put, what it says is this, is that God is willing to suffer a long time while he waits for you to repent of your sins. Because he loves you so much that God is willing to endure the suffering and his suffering to God because he sees how his kid and his child, his son, his beloved daughter is making mistake after mistake instead of embracing the love that he can give them. That they've run from their father's house. They've run from Papa's house because they've got it all figured out. And it breaks the heart of God when his children are living outside of his heart for them. And so he suffers for a long time for you and for me. He's willing to endure. And the answer is to that question of why would he do that is simple. Because he does not want you to die in your sin. The Bible says right there that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. So God's desire is that you would actually come to a repentance in him and that you would turn from that life. And so this father is reflecting the heart of God. This would have shocked the listeners of Jesus, that this father receives his son instead of taking him and casting him out and disowning him. You see, it doesn't matter where you're at in your life with God. God sees you. In the midst of mistakes, God sees you. In the midst of trial and error, God sees you. When you know you're doing wrong, you don't care. God sees you. But when you come to him, he doesn't reject you. He receives you. Because in our father's house, there is a radical love. This love that is so deep and so vast that you could not even begin to fathom it if you tried. It's inexhaustible. And Paul puts it like this in Romans 8, 38. It's a revelation that we all need to get. He says this, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, no height, no depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of our God that is in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm so convinced of this that no matter what you do, you are still loved by God. No matter how bad you are, you are still loved by God. No matter how many mistakes you make, you are still loved by God. That no matter how many, it doesn't mean what you're doing is lovable, but he loves you, not what you do. And he loves you enough that when you come to him, he doesn't leave you as you came to him. He changes everything about you from the inside out. You see, because he, he loves you 
His love is absolutely inexhaustible. It shines towards us with the, t- with the strength of 10,000 suns. Like you could not begin to fathom how much God absolutely loves every person in this room. And like that father in this story, he receives his son broken but blessed because his son came to him. You see, God doesn't care the condition you come in. God doesn't care what you look like when you come. All that God cares about is that you come to him. Doesn't care how you're dressed when you come. Doesn't care if you come to him in the church in the morning or if it's in your bed in the morning and you just realize, God, I need you, and you cry out to him. But that you would run to him, that he would run to you, and you would see the goodness of God in your life. Do you realize how much God loves you? How deeply you are loved by God. That no matter how far your heart has gone, no matter how deep the hole you've gotten yourself into, Jesus loves you. One of the greatest but simplest truths in all of the gospel, the everlasting love of God. See, Luke 15, 21 would go on. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before God. Before, against heaven, excuse me, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Here's point number three, and I'll close it with this, that God's giving always follows his forgiving. That God doesn't stop at forgiving you, that after he forgives you when you do come back to him, he pours out blessing on your life. You see, first the son is received with a hug, an embrace, and a kiss. He's forgiven right there. And the father says, bring the best robe in the house to cover my son. Do you know who who the best robe would have belonged to? It would have been the father's because he was the chief of the house. He would have had the best of the best. So this father is saying, bring my robe to clothe my son. When you come to God, he takes his righteousness and puts it on you. He clothes you with his joy. He clothes you with his peace. He clothes you with himself. His righteousness, his holiness is on you. He says, put a ring on his finger. Give him authority in the household. Put shoes on his his feet. He's not an orphan. He's not homeless. He's my son. Doesn't matter how far he's been away. He's my child. He says, kill the fatted calf. I'm sure none of you have a fatted calf at home. What that means is take the healthiest, largest calf we have. It's big enough to feed a village. And kill it. It's time to make some steaks, some brisket, some burnt ends. Praise the Lord. Because my son, who is dead, is now alive. You see, God doesn't stop at forgiving you. He then takes and pours out on your family, on your life, on your children. He pours out on you. That's the goodness of God, that when you come to him, he doesn't stop at forgiving you. He keeps on giving to you. I want to tell somebody today who maybe you've been out of church for a long time or you've been in church for a long time, but your heart has been far from God, that when you truly come to him, when you come to your senses and your senses lead you to your Savior, that you in the end are lavished with the grace and the mercy of God. Because the house of our Father is not a house of damnation and judgment. It's a house of grace and mercy. It's a house of forgiveness and love. He puts the best of the best on his son. You see, this whole story is a picture of many of us at some point in our life where we had run from God. Maybe today some of you in this place like running from God or just like living your life knowing you need God but not making an effort to pursue God. And God's like, yeah, but if you would just come to me, I would pour out on your life like you've never seen before. I would pour out on your life like you just would not believe. This mercy I can give to you that nothing you could ever do could ever make your father love you less. 
You see, and the son says, I got to go back to my father's house. And when he goes to his father's house, he receives nothing but grace and mercy. Man, I can remember when I had one of the most defining moments of my life with the Lord. I was 19 years old. I, I was like just living a stupid life. I was, I was drinking and smoking, doing all types of just dumb stuff. At this point in my life, I was literally high every single day. I had just made a bunch of dumb choices. I had just broke up with this, this girlfriend that just was no good for me. I was with her for like four or five years. And it was just like a dumb time in my life. Just dumb. And I was hurting and I was trying to like really just get through all that I was feeling in my heart by just like smoking and drinking and just stupid. It was just so dumb. I look back now like, man. But I had this moment one Sunday morning. Here's the crazy part. That in all of that, I had never left church. And so I don't care if you've been here every single week for the last five years. Like you might be just as lost as I was that day came to church and I was just like, man, I had resolved in my heart to go before anybody went over there because I couldn't let nobody see me cry. And so I, I went and I, I opened the church up and I, I just, I knelt right there. I, said, I knelt right there. And I was just like, Lord, like, I don't want this life no more. And if you take all of this pain and depression that I'm feeling just about my life, I'll never turn my back on you again. Like, God, if you do this for me now, you take all of these addictions. Like, I will never turn my back on you again. Right there in that moment, I got up and like every addiction was broken off of me. Like the depression was gone. I was never the same from that point on. And from that point on in my life, 14 years ago, I have never turned my heart from the Lord because I came to Father's house. And I saw that what he could offer me was better than anything this world had for me. I want to challenge somebody in this room this morning that maybe you need to hear this, that God, your father's house, can offer you more than anything else in this world. Do me a favor, stand this morning still as the prayer team comes up and the worship team comes up. And in a moment here, we're going to have a time of prayer. And if you need prayer for any area of your life, it would be the honor of our prayer team to be able to pray with you and to touch and agree with you. But you know, in particular, if you need prayer over an area of your life where you're trying to come home, you want to really just get back to the heart of God. You want to say, you know what, Pastor, I've been so far from God in so many areas of my life. Right now, I just need more of Jesus in my life. If that's you, we want to pray for you. So here's how it works here. When I, I'm going to say a really quick prayer. When I say amen, you can come down this central aisle, and we want to touch and agree with you. We want to pray with you. And here's what I challenge you. Don't wait for nobody else. You be the first person to come. One day when I stand before God, nobody else is going to be there with me. It's just going to be me and God. I'm not going to worry about anybody who's around me, but I'm going to say, you know what? I want to get back my heart right with the Lord. Come on, every head about every eye closed as I say this prayer really quickly. When I say amen, you just come. Jesus, we, we just love you so much. We ask you that you would help us, give us a boldness, Father God, just to walk in the will of your heart. Lord, we want to come to you this morning and just offer our hearts to you. Some of us just in need of a touch from you to come back home to Father's house. Jesus, would you have your way in our hearts this morning? Would you give us a boldness to come to you, to be touched by you, to be reached by you? That you can be glorified in our lives, that our sons and daughters would come home to you, that even those who've been here every Sunday, God, but are so far from you in reality, that they would turn their hearts in Jesus' name.